Anyway, right, so thank you for that. Um, I'm going to unplug my laptop for a minute, but, uh, so I can introduce our speakers properly now. Um, the talk today is on what is topological design, and we have a number of speakers um, for you. I'm going to introduce Professor Mark Dennis, I think, to start with, right, yeah. and, and then he will, he will introduce the rest. So let's welcome our speakers tonight with a round of applause, shall we? Okay, so thank you very much for, um, for the nice round of applause before I've done anything. Um, this is, so this is, so some of you who've got a long memory might recall something that's a little bit similar in this slot a couple of years ago. We had some technical difficulties. This is a new and improved version. And what we're going to, so what, what I should give a little bit of background. So I'm the director of the said University of Birmingham Centre for Doctoral Training in Topological Design. And the idea is this thing, which we'll tell you about, topological design, is a, set, a new set of principles, a way of thinking that comes from pure maths, but is now getting involved in almost all aspects of, sci of physical science, engineering, and mathematics. And, we, and so in, in our Centre for Doctoral Training, we've got 50 PhD students all across science and engineering in the university working on different aspects of this subject that we call topological design. So I'm tonight joined by um, Amy and uh, Niall and as an idea of this sort of interdisciplinary area, I'm a theoretical physicist but I'll be talking to you about what might look a lot, a lot like maths for a lot of it. Amy, whose background is in maths, is going to be telling you about engineering. And Niall, whose background is in theoretical physics, is going to be telling you about network theory. I don't even know where that fits. Is that math? Is that computer science? Is it something else? So this idea that this sort of new, modern, cutting-edge approach to thinking about science is something that requires people from all sorts of different areas. And this is something that hopefully we can get across by each telling you a slightly different story about topological design. So, okay, this is a physics lecture, so I do want to sort of remind you, particularly for my talk, what sort of questions do physicists ask? And of course, physics is a very wide-ranging topic, so we might ask fundamental questions like, what are the fundamental forces in the universe? What is matter made of? And if it's topology, you might say, is it string theory? But there's also a very important aspect to modern physics, well, going all the way back, which is about linking with technology. So how can we store large amounts of data? How can we um, improve our communication systems? You know, slow internet or whatever. And most importantly, how do we reduce our energy usage? And these are also key questions that, um, that physicists are asking. And I'm sort of covering these because at some level, the problems we're trying to work on in our center of topological design are covering um, across the, the board from fundamental to applied. So what is topology? Well, okay, the first thing I know all of my students do, and in secret so do the professors, is go to Wikipedia. And the Wikipedia definition of topology is it says it's concerned with properties of a geometric object that are preserved under continuous deformation, such as stretching twisting, but not tearing or gluing. So here I've got a rope that I join the ends of. I can twist it, oops, I can't, I twist it, but I can't tear it. I'm not allowed to open it up like this. So you can say what, well, one of the examples of something that won't happen, unless I open it up, I can't change whether there's a knot in the rope or not. If there's a knot in the rope, I can't twist it to get rid of the knot unless I open it up. So being knotted is a topological property. And other examples, if you've got a piece of cheese with holes in, the number of holes won't change very twist or, or stretch, but they will if you cut it. And there's a um, tie knot as well. So you might have heard of the favorite physicist model of modeling a cow as a sphere. Well, actually, if we can model the cow without any holes in the surface, we ignore its nose and mouth and so on, the surface of a cow is the same as the sphere from a topological point of view. 
but the surface of a coffee cup, because of this handle, is not. And you can deform a coffee cup into a donut because of the handle. So we can count the number of handles. A cow in this model doesn't have any handles, but a coffee cup does. So that's an idea of using the topological properties of an object. So it's about connectedness. And famously, the map of the uh, tube, London tube, is topological in the sense that the map has distorted the actual geographical distance between the stations, but preserves the connectedness, because that's what you need to know if you're changing. And Niall's going to talk quite a bit about networks a little bit later on. Another way about thinking about connectedness, um, certainly from my generation, when we think of computer games, you think of something like Pac-Man, and if Pac-Man goes off the edge of the screen here, he gets teleported to this end here, or he goes off the screen here, he gets teleported to this end here. Now, in real life, we don't think teleportation works, but if you glue the edges, this to this, and this to this, actually when Pac-Man's moving about the screen, what he's really doing, we could think of, is moving on the surface of a donut. And when he goes off the edge here, if we've glued the edges, you don't even notice it's just smooth. But because of the way that this is glued to this and this is glued to this, you get a surface that looks like a donut. It's not the same as the surface of a sphere. So there's different ways of being connected. You might think that's, um, that's sort of not a very real life example, but one question that people are asking about in cosmology, in the structure of the universe, is, is our three-dimensional universe actually a version of the Pac-Man world? And this is a model that people suggest really could be of the universe. It's a dodecahedron, where these faces, this, you go off this face, and you come through into this face. And, it's, and it, our universe may be like it, it may not be, we don't know. If it is, if we looked at a different distant object, we'd see multiple copies of it. So it's the sort of thing that people are doing in electro, uh, extragalactic astronomy. Are they seeing multiple copies of the same source? If so, then maybe our universe has a non-trivial topology. Although, unfortunately, as far as I know, the best observations up to now, no, it doesn't. The questions we're asking in our centre, though, are a little bit more down-to-earth but are all quite interdisciplinary. So these are all our examples that our PhD students are working on right now. We're going to focus on these top four. So I'm going to talk a little, I'll talk a little bit about topological quantum materials and how that relates to um, topological bits for magnetic computing. Amy's going to talk about topological design for 3D printing, and Niall's going to talk about topology and networks. And we're happy to answer any questions about these or any of these other topics um, at the end if, you're, if you want to ask. OK, but I'm a theoretical physicist. And one of the ways that in theoretical physics we, can, we sort of like to get inspiration is by seeing how problems were understood and solved from the past. And I think a particular interesting period from the past that I like thinking about is 150 years ago. So the 1860s, 1870s. So that's, um, so they had the theory of electromagnetism. They had a lot of the theory of, of materials, but it was before Einstein, no relativity, no quantum mechanics. They didn't even see them round the corner. But they were still fundamental problems. So one question, which we still have, is what is matter made of? And specifically, at that time, 1869, Mendeleev realised that the, the, all the different elements could be arranged in the periodic table. But they didn't know what the periodic table was. So that was a fundamental problem. Another question, they understood that light was an electromagnetic wave. Water waves travel through water. What do light waves travel through? And it was guessed by James Clerk Maxwell, that there was a fluid that we can't see that permeates everywhere that they called the ether. And the ether 
is the medium through which light waves propagate. But they thought if the ether is everywhere, it should be involved in a lot more physics than just light. But what would it do? So these, this is a sort of background fundamental questions people had back then, 150 years ago. And here, in this, in this world, was this rather austere gentleman, Lord Kelvin. And Lord Kelvin went to a public, was one of the, the story goes, he went to a public lecture like this, and he saw, as I will hopefully demonstrate in a couple of moments, a demonstration of smoke rings. So this is a movie showing some smoke ring just by sending, in this case, water through a circular hole, and it sends a vortex ring, a whirlpool, in the shape of a ring, topologically a ring, travelling through the air. So my assistants are going to come up now, we're going to see if we can do this for you live with these plant pots and um, a party smoke generator. So um, if I just try to get the... There we go. That should be enough and then... Okay, so see if you can just... So there we go. So you see Amy's got some... So it's very... So the idea is, and maybe you, if you're in the audience, you can even feel... I don't know if anyone wants to have an experience of a vortex in your face. Okay, or... Oh yeah, or the vortex you can see is... And of course, you can, should be able to feel it even if you run out, run out of smoke. The smoke's just to help us see it. So, um, okay, so let's, well, we could try that at the end. Let's thank Amy and Niall for their <laughs> demonstration. Okay, so, so that's a nice demonstration. Or, as I say, the, you get the vortex ring in the air, whether or not you can see it, but obviously the smoke makes it easy to see. Um, and it's not just the air. Um, here, so it turns out dolphins can learn how to blow vortex rings, and this is a famous movie of dolphins playing with them, and they can learn how to push them around and eat them and make them bigger and so forth. So the idea is you can see these vortices flowing in the water really look like particles. You can push them around, you can, you can bend them and so on. And this is what Lord Kelvin was thinking as he, as he watched the, this. He thought, well, in the fluid around him, which is the air, you've got these vortex rings that look like particles. So maybe, just maybe, that's true for the ether. So maybe there are vortex rings in the ether all the time, and that's what atoms are. So what are atoms, is a fundamental question, is or maybe if, if this fluid is everywhere, then you, we've got these vortex rings and they are different particles. And actually, because these vortex rings, I can't break them, I can't open them, if the vortex ring is tied into a knot, that knot's not going to go away. So maybe the different sorts of atoms we get from the periodic table are different sorts of knots in vortices in the ether. A bit of a weird idea, but at the time, no one had a better idea of what atoms were. Of course, we know it's wrong now, I should say. I'm not... Um, and the idea didn't go away. So here's Pointing himself, we're in the Pointing Lecture Theatre, Pointing, the first professor of physics at Birmingham. This is in 1899, so 30 years later. As we watch the weaving of the garment of nature, we resolve it in imagination to threads of ether spangled over with beads of matter. We look closer, the beads of matter vanish. They're mere knots and loops in the threads of ether. So what makes this, I mean, okay, we know it's wrong, but what makes this a good or a bad model of fundamental particles? So are atoms not in vortex loops? I should add, this is my artist's impression of different knots as different um, atoms in the periodic table. But what you can see is that 
you know, they do account for the fact that different atoms are stable and don't change into each other because knots can't be deformed into each other because of topology. Atomic spectra, no explanation of that. They could be vibration modes of fluid vortex knots. Molecules are linked knots, so chemistry is just applied knot theory. And the periodic table would be a table of possible knots. So, you know, it seemed plausible. And in particular, this guy, who was actually the guy doing the demonstration that um, Calvin saw, Peter Guthrie Tate, who was a professor at Edinburgh, he, inspired by this, created the first periodic table of knots. And this is his, what he managed to do. It's not quite the same as the periodic table of the elements, but you can see that there's, you can see all sorts of different knots. And actually, from a point of view of modern knot theory, what he got is almost all correct and remarkable, given that he didn't have any mathematical tools. He was just doing it with bits of paper and threads and things. Of course, this is wrong. I just want to make sure everybody knows. Quantum mechanics is the correct theory we have to describe atoms. But it's worth thinking what we now think of electrons are sort of probability clouds attracted to the nucleus by the Coulomb interaction, and then they slop around on the surface of the sphere um, as waves, and it's the different harmonics of the waves that give us the different sorts of um, orbits that we associate with the structure of the periodic table. So, you know, so I'm sure from Kelvin's point of view, this would have looked just as strange as fluid knots, but um, this is, of course, well established as what is the theory of matter. And the periodic table explained by the families of waves in spherical symmetry. And nuclei, uh, determined by nuclear forces, um, don't really feature in the periodic table. All the chemical properties are due to these electron orbitals. But having introduced the idea of waves, you can say that rather than thinking about the waves that are trapped by the Coulomb interaction um, around the hydrogen atom, if we have waves in a channel, so this again famously seen in the 1800s in a canal, there's a, is a single solitary wave, a single crest, a lump of water, which does not change its shape, it doesn't disperse, it just propagates down the channel in appropriate circumstances. And so sometimes waves can be made to look like lumps of matter. This in, in one dimension. And, um, the, and so this led this other gentleman, Tony Skern, who was professor of mathematical physics here in Birmingham and was 100, well, he's not with us anymore, but he would have been 100 years old last year. And in the 1950s, he proposed a model now of nuclei using the idea of topology again, not of knots, but of so-called topological solitons. So the idea is if we're in n dimensions, n here is 1 or 2 or 3, the, what the arrows wrap around a circle or sphere in the same number of dimensions. So here in 1 dimensions, I've got arrows that live on a circle, and that circle winds around once. And that's like the lump that we saw before in water. It's a winding around in 1 dimension a topological soliton. But in two dimensions, my arrow can point anywhere on the sphere, and here is a two-dimensional lump, where here they're all pointing up, in the middle it's pointing straight down, and it's pointing in all other directions in this two-dimensional lump here. So that's, these are called two-dimensional, so that's a two-dimensional skirmion. This is a one-dimensional skirmion. And if you can imagine it, here in three dimensions, there's a point on a sphere in hypersphere in three dimensions that somehow is wrapping around to give an equivalent pattern. So, so this, this mathematical structure holds whatever number of dimensions we're in. Um, arrows in n dimensions wrap around a circle, sphere, or hypersphere, and then we get a lump-like disturbance, whatever we're talking about, which wraps around an integer number of times, and so represents a quantized particle in the field of arrow. That's the idea. So here's just the 3D in more detail 
So what we really see, it's a bit hard to see, but if you've got a point on a three sphere, so that's a point in four dimensional space, W, X, Y, Z, but the sum of the squares are equal to one, then somehow, it may be hard to visualize, it wraps around this four dimensional space, but we've got mathematical tools that can sort of represent that using these intertwined filaments. So if you really saw one of these 3D fermions, what you'd see somehow is these intertwined filaments. And Skirm guessed that nuclei could be represented by these structures. So he's uh, so taking Kelvin's idea, but now saying that maybe this is an explanation for nuclear physics. As far as we know, it's not a good model for fundamental particles. It doesn't predict really quarks, the Higgs boson, and so on. But there are some nuclear states, this one for carbon, for example, that do seem to be relatively well described by the Skirm model. But what's amazing is, once people knew what to look for, they seem to show up in lots of other places. In focused light, in liquid crystal, liquid crystal materials, and in cold quantum atoms. In fact, there's a whole field now called skirmionics which is trying to, is based on magnetic films, this is like a magnetic tape, and these are little magnets, naturally forming these two-dimensional skirmions as lumps, which act like topological bits in the tape. They can be driven by currents, and there's hope that future computers can be built based on, on using the skirmions as the bits, topological bits. Partly, these are extremely low-energy because they naturally want to form these topological configurations. So not only so 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 maybe topology would solve this problem of high density um, data storage with low energy. Um, here's just a thing done by my group with collaborators in Germany a couple of years ago. We were actually able to show that some skirmionic configuration is also possible in light beams, and these might improve um, optical communications. So again, this idea of using these topological configurations might have a sort of key for um, future technological developments. So to summarize, topology is a stuff for them for me. Topology is a study of aspects of shape that you can count, such as knotting and winding. Atoms might have been described by knots, but at best are described by quantum mechanical waves. But topological soliton waves or skirmions may yet provide a descript fundamental description of nuclei, as well as computer memory devices, which are de de being developed using skirmions as bits. And so the final thought from me will again come from pointing. This is again from the same article. We explain the event not when we know why it happened, but when we show how it is like something else happening elsewhere. We improve our account of it by likening it to something we already knew. So thank you for your attention. Now I pass you over to, to Amy. Uh, so one thing that I have, uh, so I'm a fourth year PhD student um, between applied mathematics and engineering. And one of the things that I sort of discovered that was very topological in engineering and used quite commonly is topological optimization. So I'll be introducing you to that today, but also showing you how the designs that are output actually reflect strategies and structures that you'll see in the natural world. So we take a step back for a moment and we consider, oh no, we're going <laughs> to um, do this via the showing you how to topologically optimize the head of a lacrosse stick because it's something that hopefully everyone has experienced at some point in their lives. If not, this stick is used to carry, pass, catch, or throw the ball into a goal during a game of lacrosse. So there are two key properties that are desirable for a usable stick. The first being that it should be strong enough so that it can undergo the high amounts of stress that it'll experience when, say, the ball goes into the net. 
but it also has to be lightweight enough so that these players can carry it around whilst playing. So how does topological optimization come in? Well, we're going to take a step back for a moment and consider the natural world that we live in. And actually, the structures and strategies that we experience have actually evolved that way over millions of years. So, for example, the veins of a leaf for optimal nutrient and water uptake to the stem, as well as, say, the hexagonal <coughs> shapes that you see in honeycomb. And this is, in fact, not coincidental. It actually uses the least amount of material to hold the most weight. And so that will allow the bees to, have, to save their time and energy to do another important task, such as the carrying of pollen, the carrying of pollen from flower to flower. So it makes sense to want to base artificial structures off of these natural designs. And that's sometimes called bio-inspired design or biomimicry, which is a practice that learns from and mimics strategies used by species alive today. So if I show you some examples of topologically optimized structures, you can begin to see that biomimetic nature coming through. So you're getting a sort of organic looking structure coming out. So if we take our sort of um, the head of our acrostic, the 3D structure, the idea of determining the level of stiffness of this object seems quite intuitive. So we have to make some simplifications and assumptions before we can start to get to an object that we can start to work with. So for a moment, if we momentarily forget that this is composed primarily of atoms, we can actually break this down into a finite number of elements and assume that each of these elements has the same properties as the bulk material. And when you do so, you end up with a mesh like so where each of these elements are formed via nodes and edges, which now we'll introduce you to later, so a network. And so this process of determining the level of stiffness becomes a simpler problem of determining the level of movement of these edges and nodes as the stress is imposed on the object. So it's similar to Hooke's law in the respect that these, element, these edges are being stretched and compressed throughout as this ball is being caught. <coughs> so if we sort of take these, these Hooke's laws for each these of each of our edges, each of our elements, and put it together into a big systems equation. Since there's a finite number of them, this can easily be computed by a computer. And when you do so, you end up with a heat map like so, where the red elements indicate high levels of stress and strain, so high, level, high levels of deformation when that ball is caught. And then the blue elements are lower levels of stress and strain, so they're low levels of deformation. So the red ones, you're likely to want to keep in your final structure because if you remove them, it's likely that that structure would collapse when, it's, when the ball's caught, whereas the blue air elements are likely to be removed during the process you'll see later on. And this is actually called a finite element analysis, simply because you have a finite number of elements and you're analysing each of these in turn to get heat map like so. And that's used commonly in different scenarios, such as, for example, to name a few, you have simulating a car crash, so seeing how that stress evolves through the car when it's, when it's hitting something will allow you to sort of indicate areas that need to have improved um, safety for them, for example, on a car. You also have a buckle, so you can see how it opens and closes to make sure, again, it doesn't break, for example, and how a mode of transport goes over a bridge. And it's actually very important to designers because it enables them to basically create something that will have more higher chance of a first-time success, but also allow them to optimise it ahead of time. Um, so, for example, maybe if they'd been able to account for people walking in sync, they would have been able to account for, say, the issue with the Millennium Bridge. They may have been able to, in future now, account for that by maybe using this um, process to determine how the stress is imposed on the bridge. So if we return to our topological optimization, you can see we've now applied our finite element analysis and we can start to remove these elements iteratively. So if it comes across a low level of stress and strain element, so our blue elements, and if upon removal of that element it doesn't collapse or break, it will then remove that element and it will regenerate and create a new heat map. And as a user, you will set how many elements you want to remove at the start of the process. So it will repeat these two steps iteratively until it reaches that final target, like so. And when it reaches that target, it then will stop and you'll get your topologically optimized structure that you can then say go on to 3D print if it's applicable. Um, so our heat map from the beginning would look like something like this at the <coughs> end. And as a result, you've reduced the volume, you've increased the stiffness, but you've also reduced cost and labour as a bonus.
So the starting uh, head that I showed you at the beginning would look something like this afterwards. And it's topological because it's again the same sort of thing. You're kind of ignoring the kind of length scales and you're just kind of interested in how you're changing the topology by introducing new holes into this structure to reduce the weight of the structure but also keep its strength. So if I show you an example of how this is used in engineering, I'm going to show that via the General Electric Jet Engine Bracket Challenge. I'll be able to show you, hopefully, just how important it can be. So they had a bracket to begin with, which was made of titanium 6.4. It had an original weight of 2,033 grams. And they were asked to basically create a bracket that reduces its weight and increases its strength. So you're using topology optimization. Um, and the winning design actually took on the following form with a weight of 327 grams, so an amazing reduction of 84% in weight. And this bracket actually went on to be used at General Electric. And considering how small it is compared to the jet engine, it actually went on to save General Electric $31 million. So it just shows you that from something very small, um, using topology in this sort of um, situation can make a big difference. So these designs can then basically go on to be, if they're applicable, 3D printed, which may have been the case, but I'm not entirely sure of this scenario. But for, I'm going to briefly show you a fractal pyramid, which was 3D printed. Uh, if I can get it to work. Uh, like so. So it's, you can just about see, it's sort of, it's a fractal pyramid in that it, if you were to go further and further in, the structure would continue to repeat itself. So if I show you this example here, it's topological in the sense that at every single cross-section, it actually traces out a continuous loop. And you can see towards the bottom, it gets quite complicated. But this is quite beneficial in 3D printing because it means this printer doesn't have to stop and start. So if you're not familiar with 3D printing, a thermoplastic will be heated to melting point and then it will trace out a predetermined path on the build platform. So if you had to keep stopping and starting, it would have to retract that material and it's molten, so it can cause defects. So being able to tr trace out a continuous path and also tr reducing the amount of times it, re it returns to a similar line uh, at one time could have a great effect on the kind of final sort of thing that you get, like so. Um, so I hope that I've been able to show you just how beneficial it can be in engineering um, and how you can sort of combine different disciplines to get something that's quite useful um, and creates new structures and strategies in the future. Hi, so I'm Niall and I'm going to be talking a little bit about what is network science. Uh, so I am a PhD student in the Centre for Doctoral Training and Applied Maths. Uh, I originally did my undergrad and master's in theoretical physics uh, and the reason I'm talking is because network science is a very interdisciplinary field. It really sits between physics, maths and computer science and it's quite hard to categorise it in a specific field. Uh, so I'm just going to give a brief introduction to it. So first of all, we've heard networks mentioned a little bit already today, but what exactly is a network? Well, a network is a system of elements uh, connected by edges. So in maths, this is an object of the graph and studied by the field of graph theory. But for the purposes of uh, this talk, uh, we're just going to call them networks. So the idea of a network is all about connectivity and nothing else. So the important things are the nodes which in the tube map are stations. And all that you care about when looking at a transport map like this is the fact that two stations are connected. The shapes of the line doesn't matter, the distance doesn't matter. It's just a discrete object that measures connectedness and nothing else. Uh, now, many different types of things are networks. There's a huge range of things that people model, model via network science. 
Uh, this can be obvious things like social networks, so I'm either friends with you or I'm not, or I either follow you on Instagram or I don't. These are very discrete objects. These are things like knowledge networks, like how pages on Wikipedia link to each other. Uh, it can also be ecolog ecological, so in a food web a network forms from the fact that an animal eats another animal for example. Uh, various trade and economic networks, do two banks pay each other, do two countries trade with each other and by how much. Uh, various neural networks in both the artificial and biological sense. So are two neurons in the brain connected with each other, like, do they fire at the same time? Uh, how are artificial neural networks wired together? Various telecommunications networks and lots of biological processes can also be modelled as networks. So I guess what I'm trying to get across is this is a very big area and there's lots of different things that can be thought of as networks. But also lots of these real world systems are complex. So what do we mean precisely when we talk about a network being complex? Uh, we mean that a, a network is neither regular nor random. So this is the idea that if I give you a grid like this, you wouldn't really describe that as complex. You could have some complex system which potentially lives on this grid, but the grid on its own isn't complex. Every element of the grid is the same, um, it has some nice symmetry, uh, and it has a very regular structure. Also, a completely random structure isn't necessarily complex. If you picked all your social media followers by tossing a coin, that wouldn't be a very complex structure. It would be something that would be quite easy to model mathematically, but these real world structures are somewhere in between. There's like a structure, for example, in a social network, you're much more likely to be friends with people that went to the same school as you or same university as you, but it's not just a simple structure like this regular grid. So network science is the kind of field that tries to understand all these structures. So as a, it's not a very old field, it really comes about in the last 25 years, uh, kind of at the dawn of the kind of internet era, and it seeks to understand how the general properties of the mathematical objects of networks can relate to the vast array of real world systems, which can be represented in this way. Uh, and as I said, it kind of sits between mass, physics and computer science, but then it even gets more interdisciplinary than that, because you have like a, a mathematician who's working on a networks problem, but then they're applying it to a social network, or a biological network, or some economic system. So it really breaks down the academic disciplines. Uh, so first of all, I would just like to talk about some fun properties of networks. Uh, and the first thing I'm going to talk about is small worldness. But the reason to show you why that's interesting, we need to talk first about distances on a spatial grid. So if I give you this problem, where Santa has decided that he wants to get to Birmingham in as short a time as possible, but he can't break his rule that he needs to go house by house, so like neighbour to neighbour. So if Santa starts at the other side of the UK, how many houses would he need to cross to reach Birmingham? So you probably can't come up with a number off the top of your head, but you have a pretty idea that this number is going to be large. It's going to be millions, hundreds of thousands, however many houses there are that you need to span to cross the UK. So a huge number. Now imagine that Santa upgrades his uh, transportation method, and Santa has now decided that instead of going by sleigh, he's going to just deliver e-gift cards because it's easier for him. So imagine Santa is on the other side of the world, and then Santa says, I want to get to you as fast as possible. How many jumps through phone contacts would he have to do to reach you? And now, if you think of a number, I mean, does anyone want to shout out a number? Well, so the thing about, how many do you say? Seven. See, the thing about this number is it's orders of magnitude different from the previous number. So the other number was like tens of thousands of millions. This number is going to be a handful of steps. Seven is a pretty good guess. So six degrees of separation is the normal number that people give. Uh, the number of degrees of separation on Facebook is somewhere between three and five, depending on how you measure it. So the key thing is that Despite the fact there's billions of people in the world, you're only a handful of steps away from them. So this is like something that's shockingly different from how things act on a spatial grid. 
Uh, and network science uh, has lots of ways to study paths and connectivity in these systems. So obviously I can't go through all your phone contacts, but one example that we can use is Wikipedia. <coughs> so what we're going to do here is we're, we're going to go into this website uh, and uh, let me just pull it over. Um, if I ask you, so what this website does is it takes two topics and then it finds the shortest path between any of these two objects. So Wikipedia has about 7 million articles. Um, does anybody want to come shout out the most obscure thing that you can think of? I also need to be able to spell it is the one condition. Paperclips. What is it, sorry? Paperclips. Paperclips. Why not? Um, does anyone have a second thing that they want to connect to Paperclip? Minions movie. Minions movie. Uh, so how many steps do you think this is going to be? Three might be a very good guess actually. And it's exactly three. <laughs> And you can see that there's exactly three steps. So you can go Paperclip United Kingdom to Sky, or you can go QI to Netflix, or High School and Film to Minions. Um, does anyone have any other things you can try? And I'm willing to bet quite a lot of money that no one can get more than five or six. Uh, We were trying before, we couldn't get above three. Yeah, any suggestions? So, like, if I do Santa Claus and topology, <laughs> uh, two. Um, pandas and quantum mechanics. Uh, is there any? Oh, the uh, sorry, the past. Uh, so yeah, you can go panda biology, quantum mechanics, or panda cat quantum mechanics. <laughs> um, yeah, and then the in the reverse direction, it's a bit more difficult, but you still get three paths. But you see, there there's a lot of different paths. Um, so as you can see. Despite the fact there's seven million, uh, seven million <coughs> articles on Wikipedia, the distance between any two articles is very short. Um, and yeah, feel free to try this at home. It is genuinely exceptionally difficult to get a path longer than f five or six. Um, you have to try very hard. So why does this structure come about? Uh, yeah, so many complex networks are what people in network science call small worlds. So that means despite potentially having billions of nodes, say, in like a social network, uh, the shortest path between all the nodes might be a hand, handful of steps. And this is because they have a very specific structure. So if you look at this regular grid, which is on the left-hand side, um, it has a very regular structure, but it would take a long time for you to go around that grid because you can't shortcut it. And if you take the random case on the right-hand side, that's a very short path because you can quickly go between all, any, any number of elements, but you don't live in a random graph. That's unrealistic. There's no like, local structure. Whereas this small world case is kind of what we observe in the real world. So, for example, if Santa wants to send a message from the UK to Australia, that's easy because it may be you know lots of people that live in Birmingham, but then you have one relative that lives in Australia, so that shortcut path lets you skip out the whole world. Uh, so real world, lots of real world networks are in this small world regime. Uh, and one <coughs> other interesting network feature which I'd like to point out is this idea of scale freeness. Uh, and this is the idea that networks behave differently from many other physical systems because you have a very strong imbalance in how important certain elements of the system are. So if you think about the most followed people and millions of followers in various social networks, Instagram has 600 million, um, Twitter has 160, TikTok has about 160. So this is a ridiculous number when you consider the number of followers that you potentially have yourself. You might have a few hundred or a few thousand followers if you're quite popular. <coughs> so this means that the, the number of connections in this network is spanning many orders of magnitude. 
Uh, so yeah, many real world networks have this unequal pattern. So you have a few nodes with a very large number of connections, but if you were to pick a node at random, it's very likely to have a very small number of connections. So people in network science study how networks evolve and grow, and they find that this comes about because of preferential attachment or rich get richer effects. So if you are more popular and have more followers, it's easy for you to gain followers. So this is a compounding effect. So the biggest accounts grow and grow and grow and get much larger. And it can be shown mathematically that having preferential attachment leads to what we call a power law degree distribution. So that means we have a power law distribution for the number of connections in the network. So it means you have a large number of people with a small number of connections, but very, <coughs> very few people with a huge number of connections. And to show just how strange these power law distributions are, uh, this is what it would look like if height was power law distributed. So the red graph is the kind of normal distribution of human height. It's a Gaussian distribution which has a mean, in this version it's like 170 centimetres, uh, and it doesn't spread that well, spread out that much. There's some variation but not much. But if you take a power law and match the means so that the power law has the same mean as the human height distribution, then you can see that you have a huge number of people that are less than 25 centimetres tall, and then if you go even over to the logarithmic scale, you have a small number of people that are 10 to the 6 centimetres tall, which is, if I'm right, 10,000 metres, which is taller than Everest. So this is showing you that social networks are very unequal places because most people are kind of this tall, but there's a few people that are taller than mountains. Uh, so network science kind of studies, pro uh, studies dynamics in these kind of unequal systems. Uh, and they're just to highlight some impacts of these scale-free properties. So it really shortens the paths in networks. So airport networks are explicitly designed like this. So you can very easily get between any two airports by transferring through hubs. Because the idea is that lots of flights connect at Heathrow. So you can very quickly move across the system. Uh, it has interesting effects for network robustness. So, for example, if everyone in this room deleted their Instagram account, it really would not have very much uh, impact on the structure of Instagram. But if everyone with more than 100 million followers deleted their Instagram account, then that would have a huge impact on the structure. Similarly, in airports, if you delete, if you um, disrupt traffic at some random small airports, it doesn't really do anything. But if you uh, if you stopped all the traffic going through like Heathrow, JFK, Skipwell, Charles de Gaulle, all these huge airports, the whole airport system would quickly collapse. Uh, and again, this is very important for how social media behaves. If I only have 100 followers, I potentially can't start a new trend or spread my opinion. But if I have 150 million followers, then that really changes how the dynamics of this system behave. Uh, so in the last couple of minutes, I'd just like to briefly highlight a couple of other things that people in network science care a lot about uh, and are also very important kind of in uh, applications. So the first thing people care a lot about is communities. So this is the idea that in social networks and lots of other general networks, you can have this structure where you have a group of nodes who are densely interconnected with each other and very much do not connect outwards with the other parts of the network. So this is a very famous image of all the political blogs from the 2004 American election. And you can see that it very splits distinctly into two groups where one group links to each other, one group links to its other, and there's very little interaction between them. So this is very important for how online dynamics behave. You can obviously get benign communities, so for example maybe everyone in Birmingham is more likely to know each other or something like that, but you can get very dangerous communities like anti-vaxxers and things like that. So people in network science are very interested in understanding algorithms to detect communities and how they affect dynamics. For example, this community structure allows polarised opinions to emerge in these networks because these two distinct groups can have opposite opinions, but then that's uh, energetically favourable because they don't interact with each other. Uh, people in network science are also really interested in how they understand, given a network, which is the most important node. So, for example, in this image here, the node B is the most important because lots of edges link to it. But it's a bit more than just the number of connections that you have because node C is also very important because the important node B links to it. So your importance isn't just determined by the number of people you know or who your friends are, 
you're more important if you're friends with important people. Um, and just to show how this is important, the values for how important each of these nodes are, uh, this is done by this PageRank algorithm which someone came up with at the end of the 90s and was fundamental in kind of the founding of Google. So it's to show that network, <coughs> science is, uh, the <coughs> network science is embedded in lots of the stuff that we do every day. Uh, so uh, I've put a QR code which links to a free textbook on network science if you're interested in learning more. Um, I would say because network science is so new, there's not necessarily a lot of introductory material, but this book is quite good and also free. Uh, and thanks everyone for listening. Uh, I guess one thing to say as well, so we're happy to take scientific questions, but also uh, if there's like some students here, we're also to t happy to take careers and university course choice questions and anything like that as well. Uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs>